Now, when I said that you can't just limit the definition of entrepreneurship to somebody who creates a company, because there's lots of different ways that physicians and other participants can deliver user-defined value through the deployment of innovation using a vast business model. What we've been talking about in the last 20 minutes have been primarily technopreneurs, what I, these, what I call technopreneurs, which are people who are, uh, who are entrepreneurs who are attempting to deliver drugs, devices, vaccines, digital therapeutics, diagnostics, care delivery, um, some uh, uh, medical education technologies, uh, or uh, fin uh, fintech, financial technology, uh, payment methods, processes, that kind of things. So there's lots of different ways to be a, a technopreneur, and you have to kind of decide which one you want to do because they all have different pathways. But in addition, there are medical practice entrepreneurs. And depending on which country you live in, and depending how your healthcare system is set up, you may be an employee of a national healthcare system, and it's the same, not so much in the United States yet, but at the same time, you may be a private practitioner or you may be a hybrid of both. I mean, I've, pretty, I've been around the world and practiced and, or seen and participated in various systems. And I can tell you that there is no pure system in almost any country that I've visited. Some of them have national healthcare systems. Some of them have entirely private systems. Some have hybrid. Some are kind of comp, uh, conglomerations of different systems like in the United States, which is essentially a sick care system of systems. It is not one system. Um, so if you are interested in, in those aspects of medical practice, you could be a medical practice entrepreneur. We discuss technopreneur and intrapreneur is a medical professional who is an employed person trying to act like an entrepreneur within their organization and deliver value to their organization. In the United States, more and more physicians are becoming employed physicians, working for hospital systems. And so their charge is to add value to their organization in addition to treating the patients. You could be a social entrepreneur in terms of creating a nonprofit, trying to improve the human condition and at the, it's the same application. The goal is to create, in this case, beneficiary derived value, depending on what problem you're trying to solve, whether it's clean water, whether it's global hunger, whether it's digital divide, whether it's education, you name it. But the point is the same. You're trying to create user defined value and you're doing it through, in this case though, through a nonprofit, or you could be an edupreneur in other words, educational technologies and this platform and platforms like it is a good example of the people who created this because of COVID and because of the increasing demand for online learning. Edupreneurs are creating online platforms like this and individuals like myself and others participate in them for audiences like you. Now, did we do online and remote learning before? Yes, but certainly not at the scale we're doing it now. And the likelihood that we're likely to see it persist once COVID hopefully comes under control, we'll see hybrid models. So for the last year, most of us have been sitting somewhere in front of a computer screen learning things, and that's the good news. Well, that's an edupreneurial innovation. And uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people getting access to information that they otherwise couldn't get. So those are examples of the places that you can play and the ways that you can practice physician entrepreneurship, but you have to make choices. You have to decide where do you want to do this? How do you want to do it? What is your best core competence? What do you do best? What motivates you, et cetera? So the question was asked, so what gets in the way? What are the challenges? And I've, I've just listed a couple here. We don't have the time necessarily to go into all the ins and outs of each specific one, but there's certainly cultural, political, and economic ones. Different healthcare systems are built different ways and they have different barriers to overcoming innovation or barriers to innovation. 
As I've just gone through, there are varying definitions of physician entrepreneurship. So the objectives and key results differ because people see different outcomes. They, they say, well, the objective is to see more patients. Well, that's only, or the objective is to create a company. Well, that's just one way that reflects your culture and your background and your mindset and your worldview. But other people around the world have, have different views, so the objectives and the key results may be different. There's certainly geopolitical problems, there's leadership issues, political forces, um, all the, you know, the globalization issues, the geopolitical ones um, that are, are unique to each country, obviously, including the United States. Um, a big problem is varying eco entrepreneurial ecosystems throughout the world, things that support the growth and development of countries, not the least of which is access to money and access to capital, particularly early seed stage capital where you're a startup and you need you know, a, a, a relatively small amount of money depending on what you're trying to do. But in certain places in the world, that money is uh, more available. It's never easy. The perception is that in the United States, you know, there's a pretty well-developed venture capital and angel network and seed stage uh, funding mechanism. But even here, it's pretty hard to find money. In some instances, it's virtually impossible. So you have to go other places. Um, but that's a major barrier. Uh, I mentioned that most doctors around the world simply don't have the mindset, the education, and the training to do this. They're not taught how to do it in medical school. You're not going to be taught how to do it in residency. There are very few places that actually offer courses like this one to practitioners and people who have finished. And that's something that we're trying to solve around the world with the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs offering innovation and entre entrepreneurship education in medical schools and in pre-med and in early in college or university so that there's a continuous cycle of learning and development. So by the time you get to medical school, it's not the first time you've heard about it. Um, and, or you may have created a company in college or at the university. Um, medical education systems uh, don't talk to each other. Uh, Pre-meds don't talk to med students, don't talk to residents, don't talk to practitioners. So there has to be a continuum and a handoff so that everyone is sort of aligned to create the, sa the same objective and key results. We discussed the issue of fear, fear of failure, and we just had that conversation. There's also a, lots of other emotional and psychological barriers, um, everything from dyslexia to psychological problems to uh, depression and anxiety to, you know, pathologic narcissism. I mean, there, there, there's just a million things that get in the way in, in terms of, of what people put in front of themselves. So at some point, if you want to do this, you're going to have to overcome your personal fears and your personal uh, problems. And I call it facing your demons. If you're trying to do this to satisfy somebody else, that's a tough road. If you're trying to do this to make a million dollars to satisfy somebody else or rupees, that's a tough road. So you have to have something that internally motivates you that is consistent with your values that keeps you moving forward. Um, the shifts in the geopolitical landscape, uh, you know, 20 years ago, if you looked at the road, at the countries around the world who were doing this, they were mostly, you know, well, OECD developed nations. Now there are so many developing economies, India, Brazil, Sub-Sahara, Africa, et cetera, et cetera, rising middle class and coming with that are problems. And I don't have to tell you. So the, the locus or the center of gravity shifts around the world in terms of where the activity and the opportunities are. And you have to be able to sort of keep your eye on the ball and figure out where this is. Now, as of now, about 85% of what I would call physician entrepreneurship opportunities in terms of sales are in the United States, particularly with drugs and devices and digital health, or in the EU, or more likely in the Asia Pacific. So if you're, those were the kind of three main markets. And 
but we're seeing emerging South America, emerging India, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. So these things are beginning to change around the world and you have to keep your eye on the ball. But what is global are these aging population issues where more and more people are living longer and longer. The birth rates, particularly in developing nations, including South Korea, Japan, um, Italy, United States, the birth rates are declining. And that creates all kinds of socio-political issues because there are fewer and fewer people in the workforce supporting the people who are out of the workforce and creating economic development. Then there's the technology, there's techno fatigue, there's innovation fatigue, there are problems with dissemination and implementation around the world. So as I said, the environment of entrepreneurship, you, you work under VUCA conditions, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, constantly changing. And that's the challenge and the opportunity for uh, physician or healthcare entrepreneurs. Uh, and then we run into stereotyping and bias. We run into cultural and conflicting business practices if you're trying to do international business. These days, be, at, again, as a reflection of COVID, startups and scale-ups are virtually international. They're born global. And the people that are on the teams live all over the world. I mean, I work with companies, I mean, and this is another example. I'm talking to you from Denver. You're dialing from wherever it is you're dialing in, but this is now an international conversation. And when you drill down and you get into the weeds of actually executing what a company is trying to do, you have to work with folks all over the world. The designers could be in the UK, the, the engineers are in India, the marketing people are in Singapore, the entrepreneurs and the money is in the United States or some other place, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to be able to uh, adapt culturally. And if you are going to, you know, the, 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 the single biggest determinant of whether you get from a startup to a scale up, and it's it depends on how you define that, but generally it's annual recurrent revenue. So typically a scale, a startup in terms of US dollars, translate that into your currency, will typically be, be about uh, uh, anywhere from zero to $10 million annual recurrent revenue a year. At scale up, typically it's gonna be measured about 10 million to 100 million a year. So to increase your revenue 10 times to, from, to get from a startup to a scale up is a, is a big challenge. And uh, in order to do that, it, it takes building high performance teams. That's probably the single most important thing. And a high performance team needs a high performance leader who can execute and manage the team or lead the team through vision, direction, and inspiration. So that to me, that's the single biggest, that's the single biggest uh, challenge. Now, 